The Wapaka Area Chamber of Commerce presents the 14th Wisconsin Senate District and the 40th Assembly District debate. Good evening, everybody. I'd like to welcome you tonight to our uh, event sponsored by the Wapaka Area Chamber of Commerce and the Wapaka uh, Chamber Business Advocacy Committee. Uh, the purpose of tonight is to give you a little insight into the candidates of the 14th Senate District as well as the 40th Assembly District. Um, tonight we are honored to have uh, Mayor Brian Smith, Senator Luther Olson, who will start out tonight with our Senate um, area. We have in the back flipped a coin to determine who's going to go first and second in the opening comments and closing comments. Um, we ask that everyone be respectful of the candidates and their time allotment and their response and no interrupting. Um, we've uh, asked to take the high road in the politics, even though we look around the country and it's not necessarily the case, but uh, we do have uh, good local candidates uh, that are doing that. A panel has taken the questions that you may have submitted earlier as well as tonight. They're collating them to make sure that uh, there's no duplicates and then uh, they'll bring them up to us. All questions that have been submitted won't necessarily be asked tonight because we do have a limited time frame. We have about a 45 minute time frame um, with the candidates and the questions that are there. Um, Win TV and Chris Johnson is uh, uh, recording tonight's event. It will be uh, broadcast after the fact and also the candidates are all able if they so chose they can get a copy of it starting tomorrow and use as they desire. Um, each of the candidates will have four <coughs> minutes of opening comments. Questions will go on a rotation basis. Um, in the back, we did a little uh, change. We're going to have two minutes for the uh, first candidate to answer the question, and then they asked if they could have two minutes to um, also answer it on the other side. So we changed the format a little bit there. Um, and at the end, each candidate will have two minutes in closing remarks. We did send out some questions ahead of time uh, to the candidates, and we'll be also uh, asking those at that time. So to start out the evening, um, we will ask uh, Mayor Smith for his opening comments. Thank you, Craig. Uh, thank you, everybody, for attending yeah. tonight. I want to thank the Wapak Area Chamber of Commerce for putting on this event. Uh, I have done uh, three of these uh, as running for mayor, so. It, it, I'm actually very excited to be here tonight and be able to do this. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background about myself, for those of you that do not know me, I was born and raised in Wapaka. I have nine brothers and sisters. I'm a UW Stevens Point graduate. I've been married for 37 years. I have three grown children, five grandchildren. I'm a former teacher and a coach. I'm a small business owner, a small business co-owner where I own an accounting firm uh, in Wapaka, but, and we also have a branch office in Manawa. And I'm also a co-owner in a bar and restaurant, which is on, in downtown Wapaka called Paca Pub uh, Bar and Grill. I'm very proud of uh, what we've accomplished there. We took a, a place that uh, was slowly dying, and we basically... Uh, influxed about a half a million dollars into that and have made it a thriving business in our downtown. We're very proud to help our downtown area. And more importantly, quite honestly, uh, I have been on the city council for 21 years and I've been your mayor for the last 15 of those years. So you have elected me to eight terms as mayor. I am one of you. I've always lived in, almost always lived in the Wapaka area. I've almost always lived in the 14th district. Heck, I'm a hunter that believes in the Constitution and the Second Amendment. I even adhere to the no-shave Vember rule, even though you can't see it too well on my face. <laughs> and not only that, but I also prepare for hunting. I've already listened to the second day of deer camp twice in this month alone. So um, I'm a fiscally responsible person. As mayor, I've balanced the budgets by paying down the debt. As an accountant, I help clients to make sure that they do not overspend. I'm going to try very hard not to raise taxes. I'm going to, 
I'm going to look and hopefully try and tighten up every loophole that there is at the state level in income tax reasons to help, uh, to help us uh, to get through our, our budget considerations. And I want to work very hard to reduce the tax gap. There's a $1 billion tax gap uh, in the state of Wisconsin alone, and I want to make sure that uh, using my expertise as an accountant and as a mayor, I have that ability uh, to look at things and make sure that I can do that. Thank you. That was a quick four minutes, by the way. <laughs> Senator Olson, your four minutes. Sure. Uh, good evening, and thank you very much for having this uh, forum tonight. I think uh, this is the fourth one that uh, Brian and I have um, been at, and I think that they're really a great event for people to see us in person and, and compare uh, notes on us. I uh, live in the city of Ripon. I uh, was born and raised in, in Berlin, lived in Auroraville for my whole life. I live in Ripon with my wife, Joan, uh, a small business owner and a part-time farmer. In fact, the only thing I got to do this year was pick rocks at the farm, but that's probably all right. Um, I uh, was on the Berlin Area School Board for 21 years. I was the president for nine. Uh, I was on the Washera County Fair Board. Um, I spent a number of years on the Manitowoc Mutual Insurance Board and the Mutual Wausau Insurance Advisory Council, uh, former church council president and member. Um, I sing in our church choir and uh, I lead the adult forum at our church every Sunday in the fall and winter and spring. Um, a few things that I've done, and I, I wanted to go over some of the things that uh, I've been involved in in the 12 years that I have been in the, in the Senate. Uh, because I, I think people really probably don't know that the 14th Senate District has a representation, uh, a representation on a lot of boards and, and commissions. I uh, chair the Education Committee in the State Senate. I'm the Vice Chair of the Joint Finance Committee, which is the committee that takes the Governor's budget and reworks it. Uh, I'm a member of the Insurance and Housing Committee. I'm on the, National Re uh, the Natural Resources Board. I'm a member of the ECB board, and that's the board that is responsible for public uh, radio and TV. I sit on the SCURB board, which is a board that's responsible for the capital and the uh, governor's residence. Um, I've been on for a couple of years the claims board, which is the five members of the claims board that when people uh, have claims against the state of Wisconsin, we decide uh, if we should pay them or not. and we have claims there anywhere from $65 million down to $10 sometimes. Uh, I'm a member of the Governor's uh, Council on Financial Literacy, DPI Standards Council, uh, the Department of Public Instructions uh, Committee on uh, Every Student Success Act, which was passed in Washington, D.C. and gives power back to the states I serve on that committee. Um, I'm a founding member of the Children's Caucus, which is a caucus that uh, has members in the uh, Assembly and the Senate dealing with uh, early childhood issues. I'm a member of the Sportsman uh, Caucus. I also uh, am privileged to represent the Senate and the, our district and the state on the UW uh, Hospital and Clinic Board of Directors, the Finance Committee of that board, the Audit Committee, and I'm one of five voting members on the uh, board or executive board of, of the hospital. In the national arena, um, I am uh, on the Executive Council of Education Commission of the States in Denver, Colorado, which deals with education policy around the country. We review that. Um, I'm also, uh, I was a former co-chair of the National Conference of State Legislators um, Education Committee and was a member of a group of legislators from around the country that looked at countries that do well in K-12 education and uh, we wrote a, a, a report called No Time to Lose, and it really looks at what other countries are doing and how that the state of Wisconsin and every state can improve the outcomes for our boys and girls, looking at what those countries have in common and how we can improve our outcomes. Thank you. Um, for Mayor Smith, if elected by the end of your first term, what do you see as your top three priorities, and how would you accomplish them? 
when I ran for this seat, the number one reason that I decided to run for this was for local control. Uh, as the mayor of the city of Wapaka, I've seen uh, way too many mandates, uh, almost a hundred mandates that have come down from the state level that have been very harmful to our local economy and have made it very difficult for us to uh, function as a city uh, without having to cut services or without cutting uh, employees. And people might say to you that, hey, we needed to look at uh, city budgets and tighten the belts a little bit. But many years after the levy limits have been put in place, the, the, the tightening of the belt is even tighter and tighter and it's getting more and more difficult for us to offer the services that, that uh, you all expect in our community. So local control is my number one issue. Education is number two as a father of three grown children and as a grandfather of five grand five grandchildren. I education is very dear to me. I'm a former teacher and a coach and I know the importance of, of funding our school systems. And I do know that we cannot fund two school systems in our state. It's okay to have two school systems in our state, but it's impossible to fund both those systems. So we need to put money back into our public schools and take that money away from the voucher schools. People that use, that use and go to voucher schools, they expect to pay for those anyways. So it's, it's, it's an issue that is very near and dear. And uh, you know, transportation, and I only have a few seconds left and I hope I get this question a little bit later, but transportation. We are uh, the state that is now known as not taking care of our roads, and that's sad. Senator Olson, same question. If elected, re-elected, by the end of your term, what do you see as your top three priorities and how would you accomplish it? Sure. Um, well, probably the number one is if I'm re-elected and I'm fortunate enough to serve on the uh, Joint Finance Committee is get our budget passed and make sure that uh, uh, things get funded that need to be funded. And um, so that, that's the big thing. That's the only bill that really has to pass. Um, K-12 funding has always been my uh, area, worked last session to get $200 million into the budget that the governor uh, took out. Um, we need to increase uh, funding for K-12 education, uh, and I, I really believe that's going to happen this, this session, but I've always been a champion to get that done. Sometimes I've been as successful, sometimes not as much as I'd like to. Uh, Brian alluded to it, the transportation issue really is going to be probably the hardest thing to get done because we do need to increase our uh, funding user fees to keep up with our, our road needs. Uh, this last session uh, we wound up borrowing $850 million. I voted uh, no on the last uh, $350 because you just cannot continue to uh, put it on the credit card. and. When people say, well, let, let's not do that, now I'm just saying, well, if not now, when? The problem isn't going to get any better. In fact, it's going to get more expensive. So, um, but it's going, to, it's going to take a bipartisan effort to, to get the transportation uh, situation dealt with. Uh, jobs in the economy. I mean, I talk to employers all over the state, but mostly in the district, who can't find employees at any level from entry level to skilled level, and that is a serious problem, and uh, hopefully we can talk about that later, what, what some of the answers are for that. Thank you. This question will start out with Senator Olson. Some feel transparency in government has been compromised. What are your feelings on this, and how will you improve transparency? Well, um, I'm just trying to think how it's been compromised. Um, we have open records in our, in our open records, open meetings in the, in the state of Wisconsin. When I talk to folks in other states, they have nothing like we do as far as uh, open records and things like this. Uh, one of the things in our state is if you write me a letter uh, about a subject, somebody can ask for open records and find out your name, your address, and what you wrote about. Uh, a lot of states don't do that, so we, I think we do have good open records. 
Um, I know that, uh, and, and I'll be quite blunt, there was a motion that was stuck, stuck in the 999 uh, amendment that uh, I voted for. I knew that it was going to get vetoed, and it didn't last. Well, it didn't get vetoed because uh, I had the motion to pull it out of the, the budget because the governor, um, in 24 hours, decided he wasn't going to sign it, which I, I knew all along. But uh, we do have, I think, a good open records system in our state, and uh, if you don't believe that, just ask some local units of government who don't follow the open records rules and wind up getting fined for, for not following those. So um, I, I think we have to make sure that, especially with Wisconsin Eye and the internet and all this, um, people see us in action, committees in action, um, on the floor, they see us all the time, and, and people know immediately what's going on. So, I think there's more transparency probably now than there than there ever was in the history of uh, the state, just because of uh, technology. Mayor Smith, same question. Some feel transparency in government has been compromised. What are your feelings on this, and how will you improve transparency? I don't believe that, transfer t uh, that transparency has really necessarily been jeopardized. And believe it or not, I'm going to uh, uh, agree with our governor because thankfully our governor was a lot smarter than our legislators were when it came to this. Uh, and if you understand what 999 motions are, uh, 999 motions are motions that are made late at night and uh, they usually have little pet peeve items in there that the legislators like to see passed and they're all grouped together and you have to decide if you're going to vote on all of those at one time or not. My opponent voted for legislators to be exempt from open records laws as he stated before. He voted against it and he's taking it very lightly. Thankfully the governor decided to m unmark that and make sure that that did not become law. Even though you voted for that exemption, you and your party have used those open records requests against me at every chance that you have and every piece of literature that you have sent out. You put our democracy at risk. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question starts with uh, Mayor Smith. The infrastructure needs in our state appear to be high. There are several proposals to try and meet those needs, such as raise gas tax or institute a wheel tax. What are your thoughts or visions to close this gap? Is this one of the... This is one of the prepared questions. Okay. All right. There's a study that was put out uh, by the Federal Highway Administration that says that there is a hidden tax or a hidden fee that's out there. There's 4.2 million Wisconsin licensed motorists that have collectively paid this tax because of our driving on the bad roads of our state of Wisconsin. And think about it, when you're driving on bumpy roads and, and so on and so forth and, and what that's costing you. Uh, this same study concluded that 42% of the Wisconsin roads are in poor condition. How do we fix that? Well, first of all, we should have we're going to do what the current administration and legislation should have done. We're going to look at making sure that the Department of Transportation is running efficiently first. And once we figure out uh, whether they're running efficiently and where we can find places to reduce those, then we're going to have to look, we're going to have to make the tough choice here. We're going to have to decide uh, whether we need to increase the gas tax. And the gas tax I call a user fee. A user fee because you use it and you have to pay for it. Uh, one of the issues that we have is, is the legislation, and, and this was before um, before the current legislation, but they've continued this, is if they would index the gas tax rate, we would be at 36.9 cents or 36.2 percent 
uh, per cents per gallon. Right now we're at 30.9 cents. So you know how much that extra income would have helped us to do that. And quite honestly, raising the gas tax by one cent is going to raise about $363 million to help with our roads. And it's only going to cost the taxpayer $5 to do that. Thank you. Senator Olson, same question. Sure. Um, as I mentioned, when you asked about the top three issues, transportation is one of those infrastructure needs in the state of Wisconsin. Um, uh, we need to figure out how we can continue to fund the deterioration of our roads, roads and, and bridges. Um, we, are, we commissioned an audit to look at the Department of uh, Transportation to figure out how we're spending our money, on, are we spending it wisely, what can we do more efficiently. That's the first thing you have to do. But, you know, our, our Secretary of uh, Transportation, Secretary Gottlieb, does that all the time, but we are at the legislature looking at how to do that. Uh, I, I agree with uh, Brian, we need to look at user fees. Uh, and, and gas taxes are probably the, the well, the number one user fee. Um, vehicles are getting more and more efficient, uh, and so people drive more, but pay less per mile. Our cost per mile is relatively low in the state from uh, license fees and, and the gas tax. And if we do increase the uh, fuel uh, tax, about 20% of that is paid for by uh, folks from out the state. So I would think that we want uh, uh, 20 cents of a, out of a dollar to be paid by somebody else that, that does use our roads. Um, our uh, revenue from the gas tax increases about $30 million a year and uh, the cost of, of building roads is, is going up. And one of the things that we have to really look at is if you let this thing get out of control, which is getting there, we're at the rate we're going, we'll never get some of these uh, roads taken care of. So I think that probably the way that's going to have to get done, I'm guessing, is it was, it was like I, when I first got elected, is pulling transportation out of the budget, getting a bipartisan bill, and raising some revenue so that we can make sure that we have good quality roads. Thank you. Fourth question goes back to Senator Olson to start out. According to the state website, jobcentersofwisconsin.com, currently has over 90,000 job openings and only 40,000 resumes for job seekers. How do you think we can close this gap and attract the skilled workers we need to fill the positions and help our businesses? And this is also one of the three prepared questions. <coughs> Correct. Um, we do have a serious problem in, in our state. Uh, whether it's entry-level jobs or, as you said, high-skilled jobs. Uh, I represent the Dells, and they are having trouble finding housekeepers, house cleaners, to clean the rooms at Green Lake. Every business I talk to has issues with people who want to work, no matter what the, the skill level is. We have high, or excuse me, low unemployment in our state, which is a blessing, but when you have businesses that are looking for folks to work, that is a problem. Uh, we passed something in the legislature a, a couple years ago, and it's starting to kick in, that uh, kids in middle school will get counseling for job and career pathways with their parents so they can, when they're in school, they can look and say, okay, here's what I sort of want to do when I graduate. What classes do I have to take? How much further education do I need after uh, I graduate from high school? What are the jobs out there and what does it make? Because one of the things that we have is too many kids floundering around and not knowing where and what they want to do. Uh, and I think that's, that's important. Another thing we really need to do when I, when I talk to business owners who are trying to hire people, we have to make sure that we don't have incentives for people not to go to work. And I hear that all the time that people just, they can, they can um, not have to work and sit on the, on, on the government doyle. And we can't afford that. And so I'm, I believe we really have to look at that. I know some people are saying, well, if I get a, work a little harder, I lose my govern, government benefits totally. We've got to figure out how to step that so that there isn't punishment if you do take a job. But um, 
and our technical colleges uh, are dealing with a lot of uh, non-traditional students to help them um, get the education they need. Thank you. Mayor Smith, same question. According to the state, jo uh, state website, jobcentersofwisconsin.com, the state currently has over 90,000 job openings and only 40,000 resumes from job seekers. How do you think we can close that gap and attract skilled workers we need to fill the positions and help our businesses? Every job you have takes a skill. And uh, so we have to start with education. Education is the most important thing that we should look at. Uh, instead of cu cutting $250 million out of our head higher education, we should be looking to invest more in our education because we know those dollars spent bring more money back to our state. We need to uh, not only just increase it for four-year universities, but we also need to increase it for trade schools and for two- and three-year technical schools. You know, and we have a real problem with young professionals and young people that have decided to leave our state and are moving out of our state. And we need to bring those people back to our state. We have to find the best way to keep the people that are living in our state to stay in our state. And we also need to make sure that uh, we attract people from other states to come to our states. And there are many things that you could do to that. And I got to tell you too, I, I, I don't want to forget either, apprenticeships are very important in our state. And the organizations that, uh, that charge a fee to their employee or to their, to their organized groups so that they can have uh, uh, apprenticeship programs and they pay for that all privately with their own money is a great way to help our workforce. And let's continue to do that. You know, and here's just one great idea. If we want to bring young people to, back to the state of Wisconsin, let's make sure that uh, we promote something that will help them. Let's, let's work together as public and private employers to try and get uh, a way that employees can get their student loans paid off. Let's make it a benefit package that the employers offer to their employees so that if they stay with us for five years or ten years, they will get their whole student loan or part of their student loan paid off. Thank you, Mayor. Um, back to uh, Mayor Smith to start out this question. What have you done or what can you do to ensure quality internet access at an affordable cost to all rural areas of the state? Well, we're lucky enough in the city of Wapaka that uh, the city council had the foresight uh, many years ago, when I was on council, uh, as, uh, on city council, and then as I became mayor, this actually came into action. But we had a situation out in our industrial park where we had no high-speed internet. And how do you attract businesses in today's age without, without high-speed internet? So what we did is we started our own internet. And it's still in place today. It's called Wapak Online. Now, some people will say, it's not very reliable in certain places, but it works, and it's high-speed internet, and it brought businesses to town. And you know what? It made it even more competitive because now Charter, or Spectrum as you want to call it, or AT&T are now having to compete with Wapaka Online in our city. So we had the foresight to do that in our community, and I was one of the leaders in that, so I know what it takes. I do know that let's not take money away from focus on energy and put that money into broadband. Focus on energy, let's leave it where it needs to be and what it makes very useful for us. So I gotta tell you, rural areas are the areas that we concern the most about. These are the poor people, these are the people that need that high-speed internet. Uh, we want to attract people to our small communities and our rural areas, so we gotta make sure that we do offer that high-speed internet to them. Senator Olson, same question. What have you done or what can you do to ensure quality internet access at an affordable cost to all rural areas of the state? Uh, great question because that's one of the issues that I think is going to determine how well our economy grows in the state of Wisconsin. In the last budget, we put, I, th I think, $6 million um, to 
put and help pay for broadband in rural Wisconsin. What, what's interesting is people, you know, the company's goal in the city is where, you know, there's a lot of people and doesn't cost much to do it, but when you get out in rural Wisconsin, uh, it does become expensive. There was a ledge council study that made some recommendations, and I think we're going to be uh, really seriously looking at that when the session uh, starts up again on how do we deal with expanding broadband throughout the state of Wisconsin because, you know, more and more people are working from home and they need to have a uh, great internet service that is, that is high speed. And businesses, likewise, need that if they're in hospitals and schools and, and all that. Um, so they were, I think one of the proposals they came up with is using and setting aside out of the universal service fee or fund uh, one and a half million dollars every year to continue to, to put broadband services in the state of Wisconsin. The, the big question and where it becomes difficult sometimes is you have to apply for that money and sometimes folks don't apply fast enough and some communities apply really fast and uh, I'm not sure it always goes where it needs to, but we're changing that so that we can figure out how do we make sure that rural areas and small communities have the broadband speed that they need because uh, the technology for a hospital nowadays is, is unbelievable and you need to be able to have high speed internet services for that. And, uh, it's one of the priorities that we have had in the past and will continue to have in the legislature. Thank you. Uh, this question goes back to Senator Olson to start. Based on your talks with people in the district, what is the one greatest concern and what specifically can you do to address it? Well, it all depends on who you talk to. Um, but I, I think probably the, the one that I hear the loudest is and I see in the papers and, and talking to people, is our shortage of workers. Um, we are not going to be able to have a, a thriving economy when businesses are wanting for employees at, at every level. And the question is, how do you solve that? As I mentioned before, I, I think you have to make sure that there is no incentives for people not working. Um, and when you get folks working, um, you don't need as many government programs if they can uh, get a job and hopefully get health care, even though that uh, is getting very, very expensive. So I, I think that is the issue. I talked to somebody the other day. He uh, starts out, folks, he puts in uh, gas pumps in, in or, excuse me, gas tanks in underground in uh, at gas stations. He starts out at 40 bucks an hour and cannot find people. Um, we have to figure out how do we get folks who want to work. One of the technical colleges down by Milwaukee a couple of years ago, because we are, were need welders, offered a welding class, and they made it sure, made sure that it was at times people could be there, and they shut it down because nobody applied. Nobody wanted to be a welder, and we have to figure out how do we get people to realize that work is important because if we don't get people working in the state and get, get um, these jobs filled at every level, our economy is going to go nowhere as fast and businesses are going to look at the state of Wisconsin and say, well, yeah, we'd like to be there, but we can't find any quality workers. And once we do that, there's not going to be money for schools, there's not going to be money for roads, there's not going to be money for MA, there's not going to be money for anything. And so I think that's probably the the thing that I hear the most important issue people are concerned about. Thank you. Mayor Smith, same question. Based on your talks with people within the district, what is the one greatest concern and what specifically will you do to address it? People say many things about their concerns that are happening within our district and you can talk about transportation, you can talk about jobs, you can talk about the Wisconsin Veterans Home. You can talk about a number of things. But what it really comes down to, and I know this because I am the mayor of the city of Wapaka, and, I, and I'm with you, I talk to people daily on these kinds of things. It comes down to local control. It really comes down to local control. What is going to give us better jobs in our area? 
reduce the amount of local control that we have. Give us the ability to make our own decisions for ourselves. The constituents that are in here know what's best for their community. People that sit down in Madison that never come up and meet with their constituents, never sit down, never want to listen to their constituents, vote 100% the conservative vote, whether you agree with it or not, that's not the answer. Local control is going to help our schools, it's going to help the Wisconsin Veterans Home, it's going to help the city of Opaka, it's going to help the county, it's going to help the district. It's going to bring money back to our area, which is, which is needed very much. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the final of the three prepared questions starts with uh, Mayor Smith. In 2015, Wisconsin had the highest average industrial electrical rates of all Midwestern states at 7.2 cents per kilowatt hour. This was 12.5% above average Midwest rate and 8.3% above uh, the national average. Given the impact of utility costs on viability of businesses in the state, what plans are in place for improving Wisconsin's competitiveness through improving utility rates? This uh, took a lot of research, but quite honestly, we've had this question once before. So, uh, you know, Hopefully, I, as I go through this, I'm going to be looking and I want to give you some numbers that, that I really understand. But first of all, I want you to remember what I said once before is, is that Gets, uh, spends $12 billion to bring in fossil fuels into the state of Wisconsin. Wouldn't that be great if some of that $12 billion would stay in our state? <coughs> A great way to uh, decrease the dependency is to do re renewable energy. Now I know you can't just go directly to renewable energy. It's going to take time to be able to do that right. But let me give you a fact that's out, or a, a study that's out there. The 10 states that spend the most money on renewable energy, their cost per kilowatt is $9.79. The 10 states that spend the least amount on renewable energy is $10.28. And the average is $10.14. So we know that we can save money by just doing renewable. Uh, and that's going to just save money in electrical costs alone. That doesn't count the jobs that clean energy brings to our state. And a lot of times those jobs are in rural areas where people really need those jobs. Good, high paying jobs that have benefits. And not only that, but it also brings money to the farmers. These farmers that put up these uh, wind, uh, wind energy and so on, they get paid rent for that. And again, those are normally in areas that are depressed areas where they need the extra money. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Senator Olson, in 2015, Wisconsin had the highest average industrial electrical rates of all Midwestern states at 7.8 cents per kilowatt hour. This was 12.5% above the average Midwest rate and 8.3% 8 .8 above the national average. Given the impact of utility costs on the viability of businesses in the state, what plans are in place for improving Wisconsin's competitiveness through improved utility rates? Let's talk a little bit about that situation. It was, I think it was back in the uh, 70s or 80s, we had a lot of blackouts and brownouts. Uh, I don't know if you remember that, but there was times where businesses were told you have to, or to get the rate you're getting, you have to shut down and not use electricity. So the uh, power um, electric companies really went to the business community and said, you know, we know you can't have a business if you have blackouts or brownouts. So what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to spend some money and expand the, the generating capacity either through expansion or building new uh, power generating plants. And it will cost more. And business said, we will pay more because it costs us a lot of money to have to shut down our facility in, in the afternoon uh, once or twice a week. 
And so that's what's happened. We are at the tail end of paying for that. But we're on a different cycle than some other states. And so uh, that's, that's one of the reasons our, our costs are higher. Now, um, another issue, I was just down at the uh, power generating plant just south of uh, uh, Portage and uh, for groundbreaking, uh, and they're putting up some uh, pollution abatement uh, technology. And in the last six years, they've spent a billion dollars to reduce uh, pollution out of that plant. And so that doesn't generate any more, any, any more electricity, but it costs money. Uh, one of the things that uh, I worked with uh, Representative Peterson on is to get rid of our moratorium on nuclear energy. Now, I don't know if we're ever going to have nuclear energy in, in this state, but um, what, what's interesting is we need to look at that, and that needs to be one of the portfolios in, in the state of Wisconsin. Unfortunately, we just had a power plant close because uh, electricity was too cheap for those folks. So I, I don't know what the, the total answer, but I think that there's a portfolio of things we really need to look at. Thank you, Senator. This question goes back to Senator Olson to start with. Considering the importance of agriculture in this part of the state, how would you balance environmental concerns with the needs of local farmers? Well, um, the, the big issue, of course, is high capacity wells. I mean, that, that's one of the, the biggest issues that we've got going. And uh, there's been some good studies dealing with um, rivers and high capacity wells. I believe that uh, the DNR and the uh, vegetable and, and uh, uh, potato and vegetable growers are going to be doing a study, how does this deal with, with lakes? Uh, we have an interesting situation in, in our state. Um, we don't, the water goes all the way down. There's no, there's no ledge in there, so you can't like dig through it and get the water from below. It just, we get it from the whole system and we have, we have a bunch of seepage lakes, which are lakes that don't have a river coming in and a river coming out. The water just seeps into those. And the, the issue, and I, I worked with Senator Coles to try to come up with uh, a bill that we could pass. Uh, we didn't get it done. Uh, we passed a bill, the Senate passed a bill, and we'll be going back to the drawing board because if you have property on a lake, that lake dries up, your, your property isn't worth nearly what it was. At the same time, we have to be able to produce food, so we've got to figure out how can we uh, make everybody happy. And I, those answers are very, very difficult because you've got uh, the environmentalist people on the lake shores that are concerned about, you've got agriculture concerned about making sure that there's enough water to produce food because a lot of the things they're growing are snap beans, potatoes, and, and things like that, which take a, a, lot of, a lot of water, although the technology is getting better to figure out how to produce crops using less water. But um, if I'm elected, we will be working on that again. But it is very difficult to come up with uh, answers when you've got competing uh, sides for the same amount of water. Thank you, Senator. Mr. Mayor, same question. Considering the importance of agriculture in this part of the state, how would you balance environmental concerns with the needs of local farmers? When we talk about the environment and, and I, the high capacity wells and also the, the large farms uh, are probably the two biggest issues that most people relate to when you talk about that. So. As, as long as my opponent has brought up the high capacity wells, there's a couple of things that you could really do. Number one, enforce the rules that you already have on the books. Don't have your governor tell the DNR that you have no ability to enforce rules that we already have there. Let's start there, okay? Instead of reducing the number of people that we have in the DNR, let's make sure we have enough people that we can enforce those rules within the state of Wisconsin. It only makes sense to do those things. And let's take the politics out of the Department of Natural Resources. Give it back to the people that know what's best for our environment. Hey, we only have one environment. Once it's gone, it's gone. We talk about drying up lakes and, hey, if your lake dries up, 
you don't have to pay as much property taxes anymore because your lake is dried up. Well, thanks a lot. <laughs> huh? Really? That's what you want? I don't think so. There is tons of technology out there besides enforcing the law to make sure that you use the water properly on your farms. I'm not saying to get rid of high, ca high capacity wells. I'm not saying to get rid of CAFOs. I know they make money. I'm not against any of those things. I want to make sure that you follow the rules so that it does not affect the environment and the people that are around them. Back to uh, Mayor Smith to start this question. Um, how do you think the state should fund our public schools? I, I think it, we both could probably say we could spend about uh, two days talking about uh, our concerns about education and, and how we could do it best. Because if there's one thing that uh, that uh, we disagree of most on, the parties disagree the most on, it's probably education, quite honestly. So, setting that up, I just want you to know the facts here, okay? And this is important to us, okay? Um, in, since 2010, there's been over $8.5 million cut in education to the districts of the 14th, the, the school districts in the 14th district. That's $8.5 million. Chairman of Education, but we lost $8.5 million. Well, PACA School District alone has lost 23% funding decrease since 2013, or 2010. We cannot, pay, we cannot afford to pay for two school systems in our state. As I said before, $260 reduced for every public student that there is in our state an increase of $960 to all students that go to the private voucher schools in our state. We cannot afford to continue to do that. And not only that, but then the state comes up with this great idea, we're going to give people a deduction on their state income tax return if they send their kids to a voucher school. What a great idea. So under my watch, or under, what I would really like to see is I would like to see us go back to making sure that the funding is done properly and you're going to say, okay, we can do referendums. You know what referendums do? It puts it back on the locals' backs. So now we're going to pay more taxes towards our school. It's already our tax dollars that are at the state. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Senator, um, question for you as well. How do you think the state... How do you think the state should fund our public schools? Well, I think that there has to be a balance between state aid and uh, local property taxes. Countries and states that don't, that the uh, locals don't have any skin in the game through property taxes don't do very well. Their kids don't do very well because it's the, it's the state money coming from somebody else and they really don't uh, value the education as much as they should. The, the big question, though, is how much should the state and the locals pay? And we have a, a system in place, um, equalized aid formula, that says if you're a wealthy, wealthy community, like I represent a couple of them, the Dells and Green Lake, they get no state aid, or very, very little. And there's districts that get a lot of state aid, so their property taxes are lower. I guess, you know, my opponent sort of jumped into the school choice thing. Um, and you can't fund two school systems. And talking about um, the tax deduction, I, I guess the question is, we have to look at this thing. We have 830,000 kids that go to the public schools right now. There's about 130,000 kids that go to private schools. And one of the things that I have gnawing in the back of my head as our, uh, unfortunately, we have more kids on free and reduced lunches, and people cannot afford to send their kids to private schools. They're going to go to the public schools. That's a hundred and well, there's thirty thousand in the in the choice program. That's a hundred thousand kids that we will have to pay for in the public school system. Just think about this. And so maybe it might be a little good investment to uh, fund kids 
that are their families are below 185 percent of poverty to stay in the public or the private schools because if they come to uh, the public schools, which would great because we're responsible for doing that, you can figure about 1.2 billion dollars more in cost to to educate these kids. So we have to make sure that that they get a good education and we, we have to look at the situation to figure out which is the best way to go. Thank you, Senator. Um, we are at a little bit of a bewitching hour here. Not enough for a full question, but a uh, little too much time for your closing comments. So we'll add one minute to your closing comments, if you could also include this with it. Describe how you will make a difference to your district in Madison and for the state of Wisconsin. If you'd include, include that with your closing comments, we'd appreciate it. Sure. And I, I guess I go first, right? Because yes. Brian's last. Um, well, I've tried to, to make a difference uh, in my career in, in Madison. Uh, as I look at this job, I'm a delegate and a trustee. A delegate uh, goes to Madison or whatever to do the wishes of the people who elect them. And so you have to figure out, okay, when you run, what do you stand for, and do you get elected, and you really need to do those things. A trustee, on the other hand, is a person who looks at the issues, because there's a lot of issues that we deal with, and does the research and tries to come up with what is the right answer dealing with those pieces of legislation. And you can't be a trustee if you aren't a good delegate. And you have to continue to um, make sure that you make the best informed decisions that you can make. You're not going to make perfect decisions every time because uh, information changes over time and hindsight is always 2020. But I, I think that that is one of the ways and the, the main way I look at this job. Um, we also um, pass laws, but a, a big part of our job is dealing with constituent work. We have constituents that call us from the 14th Senate District that have issues that they need help with dealing with the, the state government. Sometimes we get calls dealing with the federal government and we have to pass them on to the right, right person. That takes time and experience to figure out where do you go to help folks get the answers that they need to solve their problems. And some of the problems are, are really pretty serious. I take this uh, position very, very seriously. I remember when I uh, first ran, they said, oh, Luther, it's a part-time job. Well, it's not a part-time job. It's not a full-time job. It is a way of life. You are on call 24-7 because we're every, in fact, it's sort of interesting when I go to the grocery store, my wife usually gets done with the shopping list and I'm still in aisle three talking to constituents about issues. That's sort of the, the, the life I lead. And so we have a representative government and people ex expect us to go to Madison and represent their wills and do what you think and what they think is the best uh, for the district and also the state of Wisconsin. Because honestly, our district is really no different than a majority of the state. And so um, I would ask for your vote on November 8th. It's been an honor to be your state senator, and I hope to continue that. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Mr. Mayor, uh, if you would also add into your closing comments, describe how you will make a difference to your district in Madison and for the state of Wisconsin. As I said in my opening statement, you know, I, I've got uh, quite a bit of experience, and maybe that's because I'm older, but uh, I am a small business owner. I'm the mayor. I'm a former teacher. I've done a lot of different things in our community. I'm one of you. I'm one that sits down and talks to you every day. I'm one that eats fish fries with you people. Can you imagine what you can have if you have good fair representation down in Madison with somebody that you know has an open door policy. As the mayor of City Wapaka, I have two days that I spend, uh, a, an afternoon, Tuesday afternoon, and a Thursday morning where I have an open door policy for people to come in and see me. 
And there are days, there are weeks, where people don't come in to see me at all. But I'll tell you, I learned, and actually from a Republican, Republican Representative Jean Hundermark, she used to come down here every month and sit in our conference room, in the city's conference room, and say, hey, <coughs> wait for people to come in. And I said to her one time, I said, Jean, why do you come down here? Nobody comes in here. And she says, all it takes is that one person that comes in that has a concern, a person that you want to talk to, or they want to talk to you, and it makes your day, and it, and it really represents what I'm trying to do in this. And that's not the only city that she did it in. Of course, she did it uh, throughout the 40th district as she did that. You want to vote for me because I'm a proven leader. I'm somebody that has financially been successful in two businesses in this city. I have been elected as your mayor for eight terms in the city of Wapaka. That means a lot. It means a lot to me. I am the longest serving mayor in Wapaka's history. So you know what you're getting with me when you get, when you get down there. Thank you. Um, for those as well, I uh, neglected to say the debate will also be aired on Wapaka Radio 96.3 along with Win TV. Um, so that's also going to be out there for you. I'd like to thank uh, Mayor Brian Smith, Senator Luther Olson for participating tonight with the... Uh, <laughs> and we'll take a few minutes in between here and we'll um, get ready for the... Uh, 40th Assembly District as well. Thank you. Next up is the 40th Assembly District debate with Representative Kevin Peterson, Republican, and Dimitri Martin, Democrat. Again, we've asked uh, if you've selected or written any questions, they've been brought up. We'll add those into the comments and the question period. We do have the same format where we'll have four minutes uh, for each candidate to go forward do their opening comments, and at the end have two minutes for their closing comments. Based on the uh, coin flip in the back before we started tonight, um, Mr. Martin is going to start with uh, opening comments and he'll finish with the closing comments. Mr. Martin. All right, thank you. Uh, a little bit about who I am. I'm 46 years old. Uh, after college, I took an executive position with the Boy Scouts, serving Wapaka and Washera counties. It was here that I met my wife, started my own business, and we had a daughter together. I decided to run for public office because I believe that the system is not working in the best interests of mom and pops, of family farmers, and of working class people in our communities. We have a pay for play system where lobbyists and money controls the laws that do and don't get passed. And so we have mom and pops that have to compete with national chains. National chains that get special tax breaks, incentives, loopholes written by legislators in exchange for campaign contributions. It's the same for family farmers versus factory farmers. We're losing our mom and pops, we're losing our family farmers, and our middle class. So we need to change things. We need to keep the lobbyist money from ruling our political process. It's idealistic, but not impossible. Bob LaFollette did it a century ago when the railroad and lumber barons pretty much ran our state. He understood the problem, and he passed legislation that's still on our books today that says a corporation cannot contribute directly to a candidate's campaign. Well, that lasted for about 70 years, and Wisconsin had squeaky clean politics. But about four decades ago, the corporations found a loophole, and they began forming political action committees a separate legal entity by which they were able to funnel campaign contributions and once again circumvent the law. And so it's time once again to fight back. And that's what I'm here to do. 
I want to pass legislation that says that if you're running for office in Wisconsin, you can only accept campaign contributions from your constituents. Not the lobbyists, not the special interests, not the corporations or the parties, just the people that you're supposed to represent. My plan is to form a coalition of freshmen who are not yet beholden to the lobbyists to co-sponsor this legislation and try and push it through. It's going to be an uphill fight, but I have a long-term plan as well. This binder is filled with petitions separated by municipality. There are hundreds of signatures in this binder of people who support the legislation that I'd like to pass. What's more, when I get enough signatures in cities and villages, I can submit these petitions to the municipal clerk who will have to put it up for local referendum, which when passes becomes binding ordinance on our local officials. If this legislation doesn't pass in my first term in Madison, I want to tell other legislators who fought beside me, look, you can get elected without accepting campaign contributions. I did it and you can do it too. I've gathered thousands of signatures in every district and every city and village in my district has put this up for referendum. As you go back to your districts and campaign for re-election, gather signatures, lock up your cities and villages, and let's return stronger and fight again next term. We keep fighting and eventually we will win. And we must win because the alternative is unacceptable. Thank you, Mr. Martin. Um, everybody, if we could, um, could we ask that you withhold the applause till the end of the night? Uh, that way we might be able to get one extra question in asked, asked as well. Uh, Representative Peterson, four minutes. Good evening, and thank everyone for coming here tonight. I'd first like to, like to thank Terry, the Wapaka Chamber Ambassadors, all the staff and employees of the Chamber for putting this event on tonight. It takes a lot of work to put on an event like this, and I think their hard work and dedication really paid off tonight. I'd also like to thank all of you for being here tonight and taking time out of your busy schedules. I see a lot of Cubs jerseys out there. There's a big game on, so it's nice you're in here. And I'd also like to thank those who might be watching this on the city's YouTube channel or on a repeat on the TV channel or hearing maybe an audio cast on a radio station. Thanks for taking your time to listen to this. Let me tell you a little bit about myself. I'm State Representative Kevin Peterson. I was born and raised right here in Wapaka. And with the exception of the time I spent in the United States military, I'm a lifelong resident of the district. Tomorrow is November 3rd, and I will be celebrating my 26th wedding anniversary with my wife, Michelle. Now, nothing, let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, nothing says I love you more than telling your wife on the eve of your 26th anniversary you're bringing her to the Wapaka Chamber debate <laughs> and talking politics on the eve of your anniversary. We have two beautiful daughters, and as you can tell by my receding hairline and gray hair, they are both teenagers. <laughs> Along with that, I'm a 25-year veteran of the United States Navy. I joined when I was in high school here in Wapaka in 1983 in the delayed entry program, went to boot camp in 1984, Following boot camp, I was trained and I was a, as a nuclear reactor operator for submarine service. I was one of 20 candidates in the United States Navy picked up nationwide in 1986 for a nuclear enlisted commissioning program. And I earned my bachelor's of science degree in mechanical engineering from the University of New Mexico. Following that, I went back to engineering school in the United States Navy and I worked in the engineering department of a nuclear submarine. Following that, I then went on to the Naval Reserve. So I have both enlisted, officer, active duty, and reserve time in the United States Navy. Following getting out of the Navy in the early 90s, I came back to Wapaka and started helping my parents with a family-run business, Dave's Electronic Repair Incorporated. This year, it's celebrating its 42nd anniversary of being a small business in the Wapaka community. You might ask, how did I get involved with politics? In the early 2000s, I was reading a newspaper article about a board meeting in the town of Dayton. And it seems like it's been off and on throughout the years, former chairman arguing with current chairman. And I told my wife, something's got to change here. And she looked at me and she said, you know, you can't complain about it unless you try to change it. 
So I started attending meetings, going to the special meetings, and then I decided I was going to run for a supervisor in the town of Dayton. Lo and behold, I won. And for the next six years, I learned a lot about local government. I learned how it operates at the supervisor level in a township. I learned how local government interacts with county government. And I learned how local government interacts with state government. About six years after doing that, I was reading a paper article. I told my wife, boy, I'm not happy what's going on at the state level. She looked at me and she says, well, can't complain about it unless you try to change it. So I decided to run for the open seat of Gene Huntermark. And lo and behold, I won. Since I've been down in Madison, great things have been happening. The state is moving forward. Currently, our unemployment rate is 4.1%. That's a full percentage point almost than, less than the national average of 5%. Our labor participation rate is almost 70% in this area. That's a full 5% above what the national level is. And I look forward to going over all the things we're doing in Madison and what we plan to do in the future during this debate tonight. Thank you. Mr. Merton, we'll start out with you and it'll be one of the uh, prepared questions. According to the state website, jobcenterofwisconsin.com, the state currently has over 90,000 job openings and only 40,000 resumes from job seekers. How do you think we can close the gap and attract the skilled workers we need for the positions and help our businesses. Well, the entire nation is facing a shortage of labor due in large part due to the ongoing retirement of the baby boomers. Uh, Wapaka County also suffers in particular from stagnant population growth and migration of young adults away from Wapaka County while older retirees move in. In our county, the unemployment rate is around 4%. But unemployment only counts those who are looking for work. A more telling statistic is the labor participation rate. But while some people point fingers at the younger generation, according to the Bureau of Statistics, 80% of people aged between 20 and 24 in Wapaka County are employed. That percentage would be higher if it were not that 60% of high school graduates enroll in higher education. Allowing for higher education, about 80% of women and 90% of men participate in the workforce until they reach the age of 55. After that, the rate drops down very fast so that only 65% of the people age 60 are participating in the workforce. So we've got a huge untapped amount of senior citizens that could be participating in the workforce or pre-senior citizens. Um, I don't think it's fair to be blaming the youth, uh, especially when many of them are in college. So how do we improve our labor participation? Of the 10% not participating under the age of 55, how many of those are on welfare? Reforming our welfare system may get a fraction of those back into the workforce. However, we also need to keep our aging population healthy to prevent disabilities and offer incentives to help keep them working until retirement. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Martin. Representative Peterson, same question. According to the state, uh, state website, jobcentersofwisconsin.com, the state currently has over 90,000 job openings and only 40,000 resumes from skilled job seekers. How, how do you think you can work to close the gap and attract the skilled workers we need to fill the positions and help our businesses? A few years ago, before the GM plant shut down in Janesville, I got to go down there and take a tour of it. And it was very interesting because in modern day industry, we no longer have stocking of parts and things. What we do is everything is on a time schedule. A train load of tires has to come in on time. A truckload of axles had to come in on time. And if a truckload was 20 minutes late, the assembly line shut down. What we currently got going on in Wisconsin is a supply shortage of skilled workers. And what happens there is we're not training the individuals for the high-tech jobs we need of today. 
We're telling them you have to go to college and they're coming out sixty, eighty thousand dollars in debt with a political science degree and then they wonder why they can't find a job and they're living in their parents' basement or working the counter of a convenience store. What we have to do is we have to change the model in Wisconsin. And we're doing that down in the Madison with some bills we passed last session. One is the Rural Wisconsin Initiative, where we're teaming up K-12 education, tech schools, and the local business owners, and we're putting the three together and we're training hands-on in the classroom the skills we need so that the young generation can see what the different jobs are about and help formulate where they want to go in post-secondary education. We're putting money into the Fast Forward program for our state's technical college. One of the biggest things we found is technical colleges and universities aren't flipping their programs around fast enough at the speed of what business changes to change, train our young employees. So we're putting money into Fast Forward so that if we need a hundred more nurses, we can train a hundred more nurses and not wait on that. Additionally, we're going to have to put more programs into dual role credits where high school kids can get college tech courses in credits while they're still in high school. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Uh, this question will be started by Representative Peterson. If re-elected by the end of your term, what do you see as the top three priorities and how would you accomplish them? What you have to remember is when you go to Madison, it's not my top three priorities. I represent approximately 58,000 constituents in the 40th Assembly District. And when I push the button no or yes on a bill, it is not my personal vote. I am the representative of the majority of those constituents. So I've did thousands of doors this summer. I go to hundreds of meetings and a lot of events. So the top three things I'm hearing from the constituents that are going to be priorities when I go back down to Madison, number one and two pretty much tie. Number one is jobs, and it's not the creation as much anymore of jobs, but it's finding skilled workers for the jobs. You can't go into any business in the area without seeing a help wanted signs, all positions, all hours. So we got to come up, and as we talked in the previous question, training and getting more employees. Some of that means, too, what we have to do is what we have to do is find able-bodied adults and stop paying them not to work and train them to start working. Number two is education. K-12 education, education for jobs, along with post-secondary education at our schools. I'm hearing that a lot. And whatever it takes to educate a child is what the parents are telling me. It's fine if your child is doing good in school, but we should not put our noses up at other parents that kids are having trouble in school and think we're better than them to tell them that they shouldn't put their kids in other education forms if they're having trouble in the public K-12 system. And the third thing I'm hearing the most about from constituents is efficient, effective use. People do not want their taxpayer money wasted or squandered. And that's what I'm hearing the most in the top three, and that's what I'll work on when I go down to Madison, along with issues of the constituents. Thank you, Representative. Mr. Martin, same question. If elected by the end of your term, what do you see are your top three priorities, and how would you accomplish them? Well, I have knocked on thousands of doors in this district, and uh, not one of those doors has told, told me that uh, Mr. Peterson has knocked on their door. As a matter of fact, most people tell me it's the first person that's ever knocked on their door. So I wonder how much of that is based in reality. Another thing that I'd like to point out is that I've held listening sessions in every city and village of this district except for Wild Rose, and that's scheduled for tomorrow. So I am listening to the people, and I can tell you what the people are, t are saying. First off, when I knock on someone's door, the first thing I say is, look, I believe that whoever your representative is should ultimately work for you. So tell me, what would you like me to work on? And the first thing that I get, by and large, for most people, is this blank stare. Hey, this is a good question. I never, no one's ever asked me that before. Hmm, I can't really think of anything. And then they'll just kind of sit there for a while until I offer something. And to me, that's a, a sign that people are disengaged from the political process. 
And when we start talking about the process, we start talking about why they're disengaged, it's because the process isn't working for them. The process isn't helping middle class people. I mean, if you're knocking doors, no one's going to be telling you that uh, the problem is we need more training to get jobs. I mean, we just t had a conversation where there's more jobs than there are workers. So, you know, what people want are, they want politics that works for them. They want a good education for their children. And uh, they want their, their tax dollars to be spent wisely and not wasted on corporate giveaways, basketball stadiums in Milwaukee, and uh, out of district sort of benefits to large corporations. Thank you, Mr. Martin. Um, this one goes back to you to start uh, this round. Uh, considering the importance of agriculture in this part of the state, what would you do to balance the environmental concerns with the needs of local farmers? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, what was it again? Okay. <laughs> considering the importance of agriculture in this part of the state, what would you do to balance environmental concerns with the needs of local farmers? Okay. So, you know, this question really comes back to high capacity wells. Um, you know, we live on the edge of the Central Sands region, uh, where a professor out of Stevens Point, George Kraft, has done quite a bit of studies, and he's been able to come up with computer models that can forecast the effects of high capacity wells on lake uh, water levels and on uh, river water levels and on the likelihood of wells uh, to run dry at certain depths. And his model has proven extremely accurate. So we have science now that can tell us, that can forecast the impacts of a future high capacity well going in before we permit it. But we're not using the science. So I think what we need to do is use the science to make sure that the high capacity wells that we permit are not going to have negative impacts upon the local people who live on the lakes. I mean, some of these people pay the majority of property taxes in their area, in their townships. And uh, you know, for, for them to have their lake dry up that their house is on, the value of their property could go down 50%. Who pays for that? Does a farmer pay for that? I don't think so. Who pays for the, the well that dries up uh, from someone who lives in the country that's not connected to municipal water? Does, does the big ag farm pay for it? No. You know, there are things that we can be doing. We could put a moratorium on new wells until an analysis is done on the impacts. Uh, we, could be, we could be metering the wells to make sure that uh, everyone is getting their fair share of a limited resource. Thank you, Mr. Martin. Representative Peterson, same question. Considering the importance of agriculture in this part of the state, what would you do to balance the environmental concerns with the needs of local farmers? Every vote you take in Madison is a balance beam. You have to look at the agricultural industry in the 40th Assembly District, and you also have to look at the industrial. Our, not only are high capacity as well as used for farms, but they're also used for industry. There's high capacity wells at our schools. There's high capacity wells for our cities. The farmers have high capacity wells. And what you have to look at is, what is a high capacity well? And you, the facts and figures are out there. A high capacity well is anything that pumps over 100,000 gallons. And the state has that high capacity wells are monitored and regulated in this state, and you have to buy a permit every year. And when you apply for that permit, you also have to put down how much water you used throughout the previous year. So we are on the central sands, so the biggest area of concern in the 40th is all lakes in all districts, but especially down in Washera County in the central sands area. So it's easy to go to the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources website, and you can pull a list of all the high capacity wells in Washera County. And if I asked all of you, who do you think is the number one user of water in Washera County last year, how many of you would raise your hand and say it's the farm? The number one use of water in Washera County last year was the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources and Wild Rose, 
and through five high-capacity wells pumped 1.45 billion gallons of water out, sent it down through the salmon and trout farms into the river and out of the district. So you have to look at where the water's being used, who's using the water, and then you have to walk that fine balance beam between agricultural, industry, and natural resources. And it can be done, and we'll continue to work on it at the state level. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Um, this is a, another prepared question, and we'll start with Representative Peterson. The infrastructure needs in our state appear to be high. There are several proposals to try and meet those needs such as raise the gas tax or institute a wheel tax. What are your thoughts or vision to close this gap? Well, my first comment is you should never raise a tax or a fee until you've taken every step possible at the state and local level to maximize the efficiency and effectiveness of every dollar collected from the taxpayers. You always have to realize every dollar collected comes out of someone's wallet and it has to be used effectively and efficiently. And you know what? All of you in here took the first step to make sure that happens in Madison. Two years ago, this year, you went, or this month, you went to the polls and you voted that any taxes collected for transportation through the gas tax, through user fees, through registration of your vehicles could no longer be rated. Think about this. We're talking here we have a $1 billion shortfall in the transportation fund, but no one's talking that during eight years of Governor Democrat Jim Doyle's administration, he raided $1.3 billion out of the fund. Wouldn't it be nice to have that back right now? Who'd ever thought that down the road we'd be saying, how dare you not raise taxes right away to take care of that problem that they created? So you took the first step that any money now collected cannot be raided by politicians. The next step we took is we passed prevailing wage reform. Prevailing wages increase government wages that say on road projects what should be paid if there's state or federal money involved. Prevailing wage in Wapaka County for the person holding the slow or stop sign on a construction project is $32 an hour plus bennies. If you're landscaping along the side, you're being paid $45 an hour. We repealed prevailing wage so now at the local municipal level, millions of dollars can be saved that we can pay the rates of the local construction companies, hire local construction companies, and they then now can go and take care of the roads and we keep the money local. Following that, we have a Department of Transportation study audit going right now, and we have to make sure every dollar going through there is being used wisely and efficiently. Thank you, Representative. Mr. Martin, same question. The infrastructure needs in our state appear to be high. There are several proposals to try and meet those needs, such as raise the gas tax or institute a wheel tax. What are your thoughts and your vision to close this gap? According to the U.S. Department of Transportation, Wisconsin has the third worst roads in the nation. What's more, a recent analysis suggests that driving on deficient roads costs Wisconsin taxpayers, motorists, a total of $6 billion annually in the form of additional wear and tear, operating costs, congestion-related delays, and traffic crashes. The administration has reduced transportation funding and put most of the approved funding on the credit card. Over the last 10 years, our transportation debt service has risen by over $300 million. That's just the debt service. Next year, debt service costs will exceed 22% of transportation fund revenues. Continued borrowing is unsustainable. As far as raising taxes, the gas tax, tax doesn't account for electric vehicles, and the wheel tax doesn't collect from out-of-state motorists and farm vehicles which are not required to be registered. Heavy farm vehicles, in particular, manure haulers, are especially damaging to our town roads. One idea that has merit, I believe, is to set up regional transit authorities that can develop local proposals tailored to fit the local needs and put the proposals up for referendum. It's, just, it's also a matter of getting our priorities straight. Instead of tax breaks for millionaires and corporate sponsors, 
We could be putting money into roads. Thank you, Mr. Martin. This question starts with you coming back. How do you think state should fund our public schools? <clears throat> well, our public schools in the Doyle administration, um, property tax rates were increasing dramatically to fund our public schools. And that alarmed a lot of people. So what happened was the state said, okay, we're going to freeze your revenue limits, but in return, we're going to contribute two-thirds of the public school funding. What's happened since then is the revenue limits have stayed, but the state has consistently cut back on the two-thirds funding that it said it would provide. And what's more, they've taken what used to be an equalized formula that didn't give any play any favors for one, one area of the state or another, and they've made it distorted. I mean, the, Milwaukee gets special breaks and favors and additional funds. Racine gets additional funds. Those funds take away from property tax, take away from funds that could go to our district. As Brian Smith mentioned, in Wapaka, we've seen a 23% decrease in the amount of state revenue funding uh, in the last six years. In our entire district, with all of the six major school districts that, that are based within our district, we've seen a 17% decrease. The state as a whole has only seen a 4.3% decrease. Well, how is that fair to us? So what I think what we need to do is go back to what worked with the two-thirds funding and make it an equalized system. Don't take from, from us to pay for some special benefits for Milwaukee. If they need extra money, that should come from elsewhere. It's that simple. Thank you, Mr. Merton. Representative Peterson, same question. How do you think the state should fund our public schools? The question really isn't how you fund public schools. The question is how do you fund the education of every child in the state of Wisconsin so that they graduate from high school? Right? I don't care if it's charter, choice, public, private, virtual, or homeschooling. The ultimate goal is every child in this state is educated and graduates high school. That's as a society what we should be aiming for. That's what we need to do. The question comes in, why are so many parents wanting to pull their kids out of public education? And it isn't due to funding. So what you have to do is you've got to look at the funding formula for the Wapaka School District, or any school district, the equalization aids formula. Two major components of it. The first is the number of students in the school system. The second one is the equalized value of the area. So you take an area like Wapaka County, or even let's talk about the Wapaka School District with the Chain of Lakes. As property values increase drastically around the Chain of Lakes, the equalization rate for the amount of money goes up. Meanwhile, what no one's mentioned here tonight on any side of the debate is, when they talk about the loss of revenue for the Wapaka School District, in the last eight years they've lost 260 kids. At approximately eleven to twelve thousand dollars per student, that comes in at almost three million dollars, about as much as what they've lost. So you have to look at why are we losing kids in the rural school districts, and why are kids pull, why are parents pulling their kids out of the public education system? And the ultimate goal is every kid should be educated, and the best choice to educate kids is determined by their parents, not by school bureaucracies on who's the best through the education. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Peterson. This question starts with you. What have you done, or what can you do to ensure quality internet access at an affordable cost to all rural areas of the state? One of the things you have to look at is broadband internet's accessible anywhere in the state. It may not be the type internet you want, but it is available. Take a look in the Wapak area alone. You have Charter Cable can provide high-speed internet. You now have AT&T UVerse, which I worked on a bill when one of my first sessions down in Madison, so we could bring new technologies like that into Wapaka. 
As Mayor Brian Smith said, we worked earlier in the days, and I was part of that project, to bring Wapaka online into the Wapaka area to get high-speed broadband internet into the rural areas. You have Star Communications out of Waiwiga, which is a competitor of Wapaka online. You have cell phone companies now putting up towers, so you need to make sure we can put up more towers in rural areas so that we can transmit broadband signals to those hilly areas. And along with that, you also have satellite internet resources, which probably would be your last choice due to the cost, but there is broadband available. As Luther Olson said, Senator, we put $6 million into the program last year to bring internet to rural areas. Well, PAC Online was one of the recipients of those grants to bring broadband into this area. What we're doing now is we have a rural broadband initiative down in Madison where we're mapping the areas. Where does the money need to go to get higher speed internet into the rural areas? But the truth comes in, it's very expensive to plow fiber into the ground. So if you live 20 miles out of Wapaka on a dead-end road and there's only three houses from the major hub and they have to plow internet five miles, it's probably not going to be cost-effective with current technology to get that to you anytime soon. So we always have to be looking into the future and expanding all accesses of electronic transmission for broadband into the rural areas. Thank, Thank you, you, Representative. Mr. Martin, same question. Sure. What have you done or what can you do to ensure quality internet access at an affordable cost to all rural areas of the state? Well, first of all, I think that the cost should not just fall upon the rural areas themselves because the wonderful thing about the internet is it connects the rural areas with the urban areas and that helps the urban areas increase their sales as well. So I think that whatever funding mechanism we come up with um, needs to be a distributed across the, the state. Um, now, how do we go about doing that? Uh, you know, I, I think that the answer would be to look at what other states have done and do a comparison. See what other states, what's worked well for other states. Let's not um, you know, reinvent the wheel. This has been an issue uh, for a long time in a lot of different areas of the country and some have solved it more efficiently than others. Um, the other thing I, I've mentioned is that in Wisconsin, there used to be a thing where uh, electricity wasn't available in the rural areas. And it was important enough to the state that they made sure that uh, we had a rural electrification initiative. And uh, power lines were laid out to the rural areas. So I don't think that we can wait upon the rural townships to have to pay for this, or the people living in the rural areas to pay for it. This should be a state level initiative, and the funding should be prioritized in the budget making process. And perhaps some of that funding could have come from, say, not giving uh, millions of dollars to build a basketball stadium, or perhaps the manufacturing and agriculture credit that went to a bunch of billionaires. Uh, instead of working class uh, family farmers and, and small scale fabricators. The money's out there, it's just a matter of allocating it. And it shouldn't come from focus on energy. Thank you, Mr. Martin. Um, we'll start with you with this, and it's the last of the three prepared questions. In 2015, Wisconsin had the highest average industrial electrical rates of all Midwestern states at 7.28 cents per kilowatt hour. This was 12.5% above the average Midwest rate and 8.3% above the national rate. Given the impact of the utility costs on viable businesses in the state, what plans are in place for improving Wisconsin's competitiveness through improved utility rates? Okay, so uh, even if we pay a penny more per kilowatt in Wisconsin, our electric rates are lower today than they were 25 years ago. Perhaps if our electricity wasn't generated using fossil fuels imported from all over the United States, then our rates would be lower. Perhaps Wisconsin should instead use our manufacturing prowess to become the leader in the nation in building solar uh, wind, windmills and uh, solar panels. But you know, this question really isn't about industrial ratepayers. 
It's about providing an opportunity to reframe the conversation about Mr. Peterson's bill that led to lifting the nuclear moratorium in Wisconsin. I see he's flipping his page over to his notes on that topic, I'm sure. This moratorium was put in place to protect our district when in the 1980s, the Department of Energy was looking at enacting eminent domain on three of our townships. Three townships, they were just gonna take them to build a nuclear depository for nuclear waste in the granite formation under those townships. Mr. Peterson dismisses this concern on the ground that fourth generation nuclear reactors will eliminate the need for nuclear depository. Well, he doesn't mention that there are exactly zero of these reactors in commercial use. They are completely theoretical. Peterson has put our families in danger in order to make a name for himself and cozy up to lobbyists, not to lower our electric rates. Thank you, Mr. Martin. Representative Peterson, same question. In 2015, Wisconsin had the highest average industrial electrical rates of all Midwestern states at 7.28 cents per kilowatt hour. This was 12.5% above the average Midwestern rate and 8.3% above the national average. Given the impact of utility costs on viable, viability of businesses in the state, what plans are in place for improving Wisconsin's competitiveness through improved utility rates? Well, I guess I'll stand in front of the few notes I scribbled when the uh, moderator asked the question. Unlike my opponent who's been reading prepaid or pre-made little cards up here the entire debate. First thing you have to understand is why energy is more expensive in Wisconsin. And what you have to look at is Wisconsin is part of MISO, the Mid-Continent Independent System Operators Grid. It covers 14 states in Manitoba and Canada. And part of that is controlled by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. And what they say is, as Senator Luther Olson said, in the 70s and 80s we had brownouts and blackouts throughout Wisconsin. So what they say is you have to have a 14% energy reserve at all times on that MISO grid so that on the hottest summer day, with all industry running at 100% capacity, if you turn on your air conditioner in the house, it's not going to trip all the breakers and people have a brownout. Over the last four to five years, five or six inefficient coal burning plants have been shut down in the state of Wisconsin and the Public Service Commission has authorized the building of new plants. Simple up in uh, Weston 4 by the Wausau Mosinee area, Oak Creek down in southern Wisconsin. When you look at the rates from inefficient coal to the new clean burning coal, it's about a 2% increase from 9.5 cents to 11.5 cents per kilowatt hour. Along with that, when they built that, they built excess capacity. So Wisconsin is currently at about 17% capacity. <laughs> So what you need to do is you need to continue to have a business climate in Wisconsin where we bring in more businesses so that what you do is you have more people using the energy capacity, the rates will come down, and along with that, if you look at the city of New London, which is a municipality-run electric company, they have new block grant rates which can take energy off the grid at reduced rate to bring new industry into the area, and the rates will come down to match the other states. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Uh, Representative, this question uh, comes back to you to start out. How can the state, state help fund local road projects? Right now, the state has local road aids. There's several programs. There's LRIP, there's TRIP, all different programs to fund local government. And if you look at it, I was on the Dayton Town Board. One of the biggest budget items on all the township boards is roads. And what gets forgotten about in the last budget is, previous to this, we just did a $150 mile per increase in state road aids to all local municipalities. You have to look at the number of miles of roads a municipality has, and there's a state number that is given to those roads. All the municipalities just got an increase, but what we need to do is continue that increase. And there's two types of construction right now in the state of Wisconsin. You have to look at the big projects, such as the zoo interchange in Milwaukee. $880 million infrastructure development. 
A lot of you might say, and at first I did too, why are we putting $880 million in Milwaukee? Why are we not bringing more of that to the northern part of the state? But we are a manufacturing and agricultural state. 80% of the products manufactured in Wisconsin and grown in Wisconsin go through the zoo interchange on their way to market. So we've, over the last few years, put money into that interchange to get our products to market. As the governor's talked about in the upcoming budget, and the talks are going on in Madison, now that those bigger projects are being completed, we can shift more of that money up to maintaining the roads in central Wisconsin, to the local municipalities and townships, and we can repair and then also prioritize what roads need to be done. Do we need to build new roads or do we need to maintain the roads we currently have in the state? Thank you, Representative. Mr. Martin, same question. How can the state help fund local road projects? I'll walk it from my podium too. <laughs> All right, so I think it's really a matter of priorities. The money's there. I mean, we've got the, uh, the manufacturing and agriculture credit, right? Um, $284 million in 2017 uh, worth of tax credit is being provided. Now, where's that money going? 93% of that money are going to the top 1.2% of tax filers. 93%. And that's year after year after year. We're giving money away to people who don't need it, who have money. We could be putting that money into our roads. What about the enterprise zone credit? Let's talk about that. $472 billion, something like that that went out to, as a tax credit, to companies like Amazon. Amazon? I mean, is Office Outfitters on Main Street getting a tax credit? You know they have to compete against Amazon. I don't think that they are. There's money to be spent. It's a matter of priorities. Who are we going to look out for? Are we going to look out for middle class, working class, small farmers, small businessmen? Or are we going to look out for the big guys and just keep shoveling money their way and then complain that we don't have money to spend on our education and our roads? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Martin. We are now at the uh, two-minute closing comments, and we start with Representative Peterson. Thank you. I was honored to be here tonight and talk about government. I'm going to use one minute of my closing remarks to close up an issue here I've heard a lot tonight from the Democrat candidates about the loss of seven million dollars on focus on energy focus on energy adds a 1.2 percent levy on all electric bills for businesses and homes in the state of Wisconsin to fund the program if you are part of the central Wisconsin electric co-op in the northwest part of the 40th assembly district you pay an eight dollar meter fee for your focus on energy if you're part of Adams Columbia Electric Co-op in the southwest part of the district, you pay an $8 meter fee. If you're part of the Clintonville or New London municipality provided electricity, you pay an $8 focus on energy fee per meter. What we found at the state level is if you are part of the co-op, Central Wisconsin Electric Co-op, Adams Columbia, or if you got your power in New London or Clintonville, you were being charged the fee twice. You were paying the $8 meter fee, and you were paying a 1.2% generation fee on the electricity being purchased by your municipality. So what we said is it's not right those people are paying that twice, and we eliminated it. And it was a $7 million decrease to focus on energy, which is still bringing in over $100 million per year. So if you think about the candidates here tonight that kept bringing that up, if they can't do away with a double tax for you, what are they going to do when they get to Madison to represent the people of the district? I'm honored and humbled to be your state representative in Madison. And every day I go down there and I fight for the values of the 40th Assembly District. And I look forward to working with all of you on making Wisconsin a great place to live, work, raise a family, and retire. Please vote Peterson, November 8th. Thank you, Representative. Mr. Martin, two minutes, closing comments. 
Well, I'll mention a little bit on focus on energy as well, as long as we're on that topic. It's interesting, uh, Central Wisconsin Electric Co-op donated thousands of dollars to Mr. Peterson's campaign. I wonder if that had anything to do with how we voted on focus on energy. Matter of fact, uh, focus on energy, when it was first developed, the whole concept of focus on energy was the utilities wanted monopolies over service areas. And there was concern that they would use that monopolies to screw over basically the, you know, the, the people that are paying for their electricity. So what the legislature did at the time is they set up this program called Focus on Energy and they mandated that all the utility companies pay in a small amount, 1.2% as Mr. Peterson has said, of their bill to go into improving energy efficiency. Now, that money comes right back to those same people who are paying bills when they utilize the program. And what's happened with Focus on Energy is that originally it was set up to be administered and run by environmentalists, by lawyers, by uh, university professors that were economists, by a couple of utility executives. Now it's completely overseen by the utility executives. We have the fox guarding the hen house. And yes, they've lost $7 million, but I have 30 seconds left. Um, term limits are the most popular thing that people tell me about, uh, if I can you know, get an answer out of them. Well, this is your opportunity. The guy's been in office 10 years. If you want term limits, if you think that's a good idea, exercise your right to vote, and let's get some new blood in there. Um, my last statement is, I want to be your next William Proxmire. You know, I want to serve you. I want to be involved with the communities. And, you know, I, I, I love all of you, and I want you to love me back because I'll work for you. Thank you. Okay. So we'd like to, like to thank all the candidates for participating today. Um, this evening, exercise your right to vote uh, November 8th. If you're going to be absentee, make sure you get a vote in before you uh, leave the area. Thank you to those that submitted your questions, and uh, thank you for taking part and in your interest in our political system. Thank you.